Good afternoon and welcome everyone to the Parks Commission hearing, our regular meeting for Monday, May 19th, 2014. Could we have the roll call, please? Commissioner Fouad? Here. Kalfayan? Here. Sharkey? Here. Wu? Present. President Khan? Here. Report regarding posting of the agenda. The agenda for the May 19, 2014 meeting was posted on the bulletin board outside City Hall on or before Friday, May 16, 2014. And item two, upcoming council agenda items. Yes, President Khan, members of the uh, commission, uh, we actually took care of a lot of business um, in April and the first week of May, so we don't have a lot coming up. Uh, the only agenda item we have right now that's um, uh, confirmed or, or um, on, on the docket is on June 10th at the City Council meeting. Uh, we have a report uh, with the recommendation to note and file with regard to the department's rodentis, rodenticide uh, policy. Uh, if you've been following the news, there's been a lot of uh, discussion and concern currently uh, regarding the chemicals and agents that um, are being used to control uh, rodents um, in, in, in parks and public facilities. And so we are uh, uh, assessing our policy and our, our rodent uh, strategy, and we'll be making some recommendations uh, on a revised uh, policy. So we will be reporting that to the City Council on June 10th um, on that. Um, and that's all that we have with regard to uh, Council um, action items that are scheduled. Uh, but I, I would like to mention a couple of, of things that we are scheduling for next month's commission meeting. Uh, we will have before you an action item to review and approve um, the sports complex batting cage request for a proposal. Uh, we've mentioned before that we will be uh, looking to procure a, um, an operator of the batting cage uh, project uh, who will then um, join the team to develop a proposal for a design um, consultant to design the batting cage and will also be part of the evaluation team to um, issue construction documents and bids for the construction work for the batting cage. Then that operator will, will come back at, at the end to install the equipment and begin operating the uh, batting cage project. So we'll be talking about that at the next our next meeting in June. And also in June, I will be able to give you an update on the department uh, budget. Uh, especially as it pertains to our proposed capital improvement programs because uh, by then they would have been approved by the City Council and we can talk about some exciting things that we have on the horizon. And that concludes my report. Sounds good. Thank you. Item three, introductions and presentations at A, presentation by Casa Adobe de San Rafael Docents. Good afternoon, President Khan, uh, Commissioners, Mr. Duran, Oko, Omnic, Iris, <laughs> I should just say staff. Uh, I'm Gladys Wymore, President-elect of Glendale Beautiful, and I've been one of your volunteers for 26 years. Glendale Beautiful was formed in 1950 as a nonprofit organization dedicated to the purpose of community beautification. The object of Glendale Beautiful is to promote, encourage, and protect the beauty of the community in which we live and to preserve our early California heritage in the Casa Adobe de San Rafael, located at 1330 Dorothy Drive. And it was in 1971 that the Commission of Parks and Recreation officially designated and so recognized Glendale Beautiful as the prime sponsoring organization to assist parks and recreation in connection with the event's acceptance of artifacts and gifts and to serve in the ad ad adversary capacity in future improvement to the building and grounds of the Casa Adobe. One of our past uh, docents had left funds in the Community Foundation, and Dottie was at our meeting that day when they presented us with a check, and then we gave it to the city for having the inside of the adobe painted, so it really looks, looks nice. We're, we're doing our best. If we have a problem, then we refer it to Coco. Uh, visitors who signed the guest book for this past year totaled 530. 
with docence hours approximately 189. The Casa Adobe is open the first Sunday of each month and then every Sunday in July and August. Hours are from 1 to 3 p.m. And we're always happy to open for any special events when asked. You can just call the Civic Auditorium or call me. And my number is 818-246-3634. We're in the process of getting a couple of our brochures regarding the adobe translated to Armenian. And I'd like for you to mark on your calendars now, our Christmas open house is going to be the second weekend of December. That's December 12, 13, and 14. And this is the Fiesta de las Luminarias, the Festival of Lights. Um, it's a wonderful event. Our pinata party has just grown each year. Uh, this past year, I didn't know Amit Anig would be here. I can just say thank you to him for saving the day by sending over hot chocolate. It was one of those cold, <laughs> cold days in December. Uh, the, this event is free to the public, uh, funded entirely by Glendale Beautiful membership um, dues and donations. Entertainment last year was the high school chorus from the La Crescenta High the bell choir from Glendale High, and then the folkloric dancers from Horace Mann School. And uh, we had a piano studio to bring, and the lady brought her piano students to play. And everyone, this seems to be a nice event too. Uh, parks and community services uh, bring a tree in, and they also furnish sand for the luminaries. And we're grateful to the gardeners for supplying greens for the decorations inside. We'd love to have you come and visit us this year. The program that I have worked on since becoming a member of Glendale Beautiful is the Arbor Day Celebration, which is responsible for the planting of over 7,260 trees. And uh, Glendale Beautiful has been the only one to hold the Arbor Day program and we've helped earn the Tree City USA Award for 30 consecutive years. And this program could be a full-time job because uh, it keeps us busy for a while. Starting in January, the Arbor Day Committee meets to plan the program to make changes to the application. And this application for the trees is mailed out in early January to people who have donated trees in the past and organizations and clubs. And when the application is returned, we assign it a number, order certificates, and to present it on, be presented on Arbor Day, and then funds are given to the treasurer. Like this morning, I picked up certificates and brought them today for Mr. Duran to sign. So it's an ongoing process. This is a Glendale beautiful event. However, park, recreation, and community services helps us by arranging for the chairs and the setup, and they also have been in the past printing the programs. After the expenses of the trees, printing of certificates, postage, the balance is given to parks for stakes and ties. Glendale Beautiful members serve refreshments to those in attendance. We've had a high as attendance several years ago of 300, but this year we only had 85. I think it depends on who has passed away during the year. And another program that we do to keep Glendale uh, beautiful is the annual awards day program designed to recognize businesses for their efforts to keep Glendale beautiful through outstanding architectural design and building landscape improvements with, which enhance local environmental quality and appearance. The recipients are publicly awarded with a framed certificate at our annual April Glendale, Glendale Beautiful Awards Day luncheon. And uh, maybe you've seen some of the certificates around town. To date, we've given over 242 awards, and this event started 47 years ago. Membership in Glendale Beautiful, a nonprofit public benefit corporation, is open to all interested residents and organizations in Glendale. Dues are only $10 a year. Our next meeting is our annual meeting and installation of officers, and speaker for that day is JPL engineer Robert Hall. Normally, we meet at the Joe Bridges Clubhouse, 
this this in June we were kind of ousted uh, because the first Tuesday is election, and then the second Tuesday in June is some, summer camp begins. So we're going to go to Damon's Wednesday, June 11th, and you can call me for reservations. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you. Sounds like you're doing an outstanding job. I don't know if any of the uh, commissioners wanted to make a comment. Well, I just want to know, it's, it's such a thrill not only to receive a tree that's planted for you, but also to give, and I think that's a wonderful right. program. Yes. It's, it's a great gift, great idea. Thank you, Doc. So thanks for all the work you do. Next is item 3B, presentation by the Chauceon Whispering Pine Tea House Docents. Thank you for allowing us to be here and talk about Chauceon Tea House, which I think is a bit of a mystery at this point because it's been here since 1974, but not, can, can you hear me and everything? Sure. <laughs> but not actually uh, so much in use. And uh, I came along in 1975 and became chairperson of the Chauceon Tea Group, and we decided that it needed to be a landmark building with the city of Glendale, and that happened fairly early on around 1978 became a landmark building so you all are also responsible for it along with us <laughs> which was a wonderful thing for, for us to do for that building and it's made a big difference for all the work that's been done by the city of Glendale for that building and for the grounds and still a lot needs to be done we have I'm sorry that um, I can't introduce her today but we have a tea teacher who is dedicated to teaching tea ceremony there and our purpose basically is not just Japanese tea ceremony, though it's a Japanese building. The purpose is helping to build community and character through the world of tea. So we have had Korean tea there, we have had some Chinese tea there, we have, when we hoped it, we'd had a combined English tea with the uh, doctor's house, and we're hoping to build a um, a day that we're, we're open with docents when the a doctor's house is open and we will have serve some tea and a flower arrangement, Japanese flower arrangement, which is a, a very interesting subject. I think a lot of Glendale people would be interested in doing that anyway. So we're, we're working on that aspect of it and um, we have a uh, um, an, uh, an active tea program. We want to make it much more active, though, so that people know. We have a kiosk now that was just put up, as a matter of fact, which will announce everything that is uh, going to be done and what our plans are to maybe have some art things going on. There have been weddings there with the uh, with the Gagaku Band, which is not exactly a band, but it's an orchestra of Japanese history that goes back to the Heian period, which is... Uh, 12th century, and it's run by people f from a temple in Los Angeles. So it's it's attracting all kinds of interesting um, indoor and outdoor activities, and we're, we're hoping to continue to build this. And I myself am very dedicated to that purpose, having been lived in Japan, and um, my husband teaches Japanese, and my grandchildren go to the Glendale Japanese Immersion School. So we are steeped in the world of the Japanese arts with hope to have other Asian arts because it's part of Asia. Japan does not exist by itself, so we want to have a wonderful program doing this um, and continuing to build this. Um, we're going to show a video that was put together by our ambassador, Ambassador Mike, who's our... Um, uh, I'll tell them. What? I'll tell them. You'll tell them, okay. So anyway, he's... Um, he was just in Higashi, Osaka, and he's a, a nice, strong contact back into the tie-in between Higashi, Osaka and the sister city, which needs to be so kept alive. It's so important to have that, I think. And just on a cultural level, that's basically to have those two cultures interact. And so um, I will... I'll, by, by the way, this is Julie Baggins. Oh, yeah, She's Julie, the thanks. president of the Friends of Chauceon. My name is Michael Belzer, and, and President Khan and Commissioners, it's it's a pleasure to be here to share the the uh, the latest that we've been doing with the the tea house. I brought our our brochures, and if I could give this to, I can give you 
has to take a look. I did have a chance to go to Japan. I go every other year uh, to just to further my practice of martial arts. And so my official title with the Tea House is, is Ambassador of Martial Arts. And because I went to Japan, I had a chance to go to Higashi Osaka. I visited the city council, and I went to the International Cultural Division, and I brought them this same DVD that we're going to show you. It's just 10 minutes. Uh, it gives a good overview of what we have done and what you guys have done to help uh, promote the tea house. All they knew is from a picture. That's all they saw. They knew that there was a tea house in Japan. The only thing they had in their records is one picture of the tea house. So really, it blew them away what, what we have uh, accomplished here. They were very happy that I came by. And I gave them the Japanese version. And you'll be he hearing the English version. Okay. Well, thank you. 50s to the development of a
The Shosian Tea House is a classic Japanese structure with an accompanying traditional tea garden and represents one of the few architecturally correct examples of tea house architecture in the western United States which is open to the public. This type of Japanese architecture dates back more than 1,000 years and was revised in the late 1500s to meet the spiritual and functional needs of Chado or the way of tea by Sen no Rikyu, the founder of modern Japanese tea ceremony. The Japanese tea house is the finest distillation of all that traditional Japanese architecture has to offer. The Shosean tea house contains all of the classic elements. The Shoseon, tea house of the Whispering Pine, like all classic tea houses, is a place of solitude, tucked away in a bustling city environment. And like all tea houses, it is accompanied by a beautiful garden, specifically designed for the site to complement the tea house. Japanese gardens are full of symbolism and meaning. The tea house is approached through this garden in a slow and thoughtful manner as a means to prepare the guest for the tea ceremony itself. The Shosean Tea House and Friendship Garden is the product of the Sister City Program, which was instigated by President Eisenhower in 1956. In 1960, Dr. Hideji Yamasaki, a dentist and deputy mayor of Higashi Osaka, chose to nominate the city of Glendale when he traveled around the world looking for a sister city. He was struck by the similarities between the cities of Glendale and Higashi Osaka, including the Verdugo Mountains, which he felt resembled the Ikoma Mountains of Higashi Osaka. Dr. Yamazaki was born on a large estate in Higashi Osaka, owned by his family for over 500 years. His estate had a tea house where tea ceremony was practiced, as well as a dental clinic. The clinic was housed in a three-story building and, after he was introduced to the city of Glendale, Dr. Yamazaki chose to furnish a room in his clinic in the western style and called it the Glendale Room. As a matter of fact, he was so taken with the city of Glendale that in the 1970s, Dr. Yamazaki kept a home in the Verdugo Hills section of Glendale. The history of this tea house, well documented in a dozen local newspaper articles, clearly identifies a large community of individuals who have significantly contributed to the history of Glendale. From the inception of developing a sister city in the 1950s to the development of a Higashi Osaka Glendale Sister City Committee working for over a decade to raise funds for the project throughout the 1960s, to the actual completion of the tea house and gardens in the 1970s, it's been a high point of interest and considered the gem of Glendale. Thanks to a group of committed tea practitioners led by Keiko Nakata Sensei, the tea ceremony lives on in the Shosean Tea House. In today's hardships and tribulations, the tea house of the Whispering Pine and the Friendship Garden in Brand Park strongly contributes to the well-being of the citizens of Glendale and the connection with their sister city of Higashi Osaka.
brief video and that you take time to explore this Glendale treasure, the Whispering Pine Tea House and Friendship Garden at the Brand Park and Library in Glendale. Thank you very much. Thank you for that presentation. That was very nicely done. Thanks. What is next? Next is item four, commission staff comments. Uh, fellow commissioners, any comments? Yeah, I was wondering, has the Rock Haven proposal gone to council yet? Uh, President Kahn, Commissioner Fad, uh, yes, it did. Uh, the city council approved uh, uh, the issuance of the request for qualifications. In fact, there is a interested developer job walk scheduled this Wednesday, which is the initial step of developers uh, preparing their proposals. And I think it's due... Proposals due in about 45 days. I, yeah, we're allowing 60 days for the, the development of the proposal. And end of June, yeah. So I know on the campaign trail there's been some questioning of, of the whole project, and I wonder if you can give some assurance that this, wasn't, this isn't a means of commercializing the whole thing, but a means of really preserving what we have. Correct. Um, a part of the idea behind the... Uh, um, issuance of a proposal is is to see what plans developers can propose to the city as a means of developing the site at the same time to give the city the resources it needs which it currently doesn't have to be able to preserve uh, the buildings that it wants to designate for preservation in addition to um, community use of a building or two and some open space um, right now without a a, a partner and a, um, a companion development, we wouldn't have the means to be able to do anything with that property in the foreseeable future. And the city council still reserves the right to um, not accept any of the proposals if it doesn't like any of the proposals or if all of the proposals um, appear to be too intrusive. The council could, could, could still decide to continue to, to leave it and not do anything. Uh, but we did want to give the development community an opportunity um, to tell us what they can do with that property and, and to see if it is something that is um, uh, plausible with the city council. Thank you. Any other questions or comments by commissioners? Hi. Please. Okay. First of all, the tea house is wonderful. I, I just get a feeling of peace when, I, when I'm in there. It's beautiful. And then looking over, and I love the porch. And to segue into our <laughs> Verdugo Mountains 10K uh, trail run and hike, which was May 4th, uh, we had over uh, close to 650 runners and hikers. Wonderful day, uh, sponsored by Glendale Memorial Hospital and uh, Massage MV, uh, were the sponsors of the uh, um, can Kiwanis baking, uh, making pancakes. All this around the tea house. It was wonderful. The stage, uh, it, it was just the grounds are beautiful overlooking the pond. And, uh, but, I, but I wanted to thank everyone involved um, who, who contributed to such a successful day uh, to benefit our parks and open space. So, Great. Thank well, thank you. Thank you for that. I have a question. <clears throat> Please. Uh, we had a proposal last time uh, to put a park at the Rock Heaven. Where was it? Uh, where did it come from? L.A. parks, or, or it was from the city? There was a presentation in the beginning. <clears throat> yeah, um, President Khan, uh, um, commissioners, you you aren't confusing that with the proposal from the L.A. County Department of Parks and Recreation awesome. to put a, a awesome. skate park yeah. at Crescenta. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, park um, that as far as I know that that skate park is still in process and is still being planned to be uh, developed at Crescenta Valley Park um, but in terms of a proposal for a park at Rock Haven uh, several years ago when the property was purchased that was one of the ideas that it was, it was being purchased for some park space and and other community uses. May, yeah, maybe a library. Um, and then the recession hit, and it, it kind of changed everything. In the meantime, the property has been sitting idle, 
And so this is an attempt to see if it's time now to be able to do something or not. To, to that point, though, when we did have the presentation, um, it kind of centered around the historic nature of the buildings. And from a parks perspective, we really didn't talk about open space or an open space amenity to that property as well, which I think is certainly something where if it's moving forward, I mean, that, that, as you mentioned, that was the intent originally. Um, it would make sense then to, to have a component, however big or small, factored into that as well. Um, and that was something that we really didn't talk about when it was presented to us. It, as President, uh, kind commissioners, and, and Emil, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, there is that component in the RFQ, is, is there not? That uh, the, the one of the components should be um, open space? Yes, there is, along with uh, a lot of the input that um, our community development department received when they were doing the North Glendale outreach, and open space needs is one of them, oh. um, along with uh, Commissioner Fouad addressing, you know, commercial and I commercialization, it's uh, by no means meant to overstress the site. Oh. Okay, thank you. Any uh, staff comments? Uh, please. President Khan, uh, commissioners, I just want to uh, say thank you for your uh, forbearance in um, listening to the presentations on the, the historic sites. We have, we have four that we are very uh, proud of and uh, uh, they do have to be maintained, and they are beautifully main, uh, maintained by our park services uh, staff, so I didn't want that to get lost. As you can see, there is tremendous uh, pride and, and dedication and passion on the part of, of some of your community, your fellow community members who uh, are the docents to these um, sites, and they are truly gems of Glendale, and so we wanted to be able to, to promote them and, and have the docents uh, talk about them and everything that goes on there and, and, and what they mean. Uh, so we have one more, and, and it is from the Friends of Rock Haven, which is scheduled uh, in June. Yes, that's and, right. And that will conclude the, rec the um, presentations for our uh, historic sites. Uh, so thank you for your forbearance. Great. Thank you. What's next? Item five is oral communications. I don't have any cards. Item six, consent items at A, approval of the minutes of the commission regular meeting held on April 21st, 2014. Do we have a motion? Moved. <clears throat> second. I'll second. Commissioner Swad? Aye, uh, yes. Kalfayan? Yes. Sharkey? Yes. Wu? Abstain. President Khan? Yes. Item seven, business agenda, A, action items at one, Resolution repealing existing fees and establishing a new fee for photography permits, establishing various cancellation fees and a day camp t-shirt fee, and increasing the existing fee for participation in the adult soccer league at the sports complex. Thank you. Um, President Khan, members of the commission, um, staff would like to have the following fees established in the citywide fee schedule. Uh, we currently have um, a few parks where we permit for photography, uh, Brand Park, uh, Casa Adobe, Verdugo Adobe, and the sports complex. Uh, staff has received a number of uh, requests to have, uh, to take um, photos of their, let it be engagement sessions, wedding sessions, uh, baptisms, quinceaneras at other parks not listed, um, not the ones that I just mentioned, uh, such as New York Park, Duke Magian, Pacific Park, so um, we like to establish a fee uh, for all park locations, uh, one fee of $80 for two hours, uh, besides the brand. Brand, we charge $235 for two hours. So besides brand, um, all of our other parks, uh, we like to include in our fee schedule. So once when we get a request, we can go ahead and uh, process the permit and charge the client for professional photography only. Um, our next fee is the Cancellation fees for day camps, skate camps, and contract classes. Uh, we operate a number of day camps citywide, and uh, due to the popularity of all our programs, parent, what we've noticed is parents register their children to safe spots for the entire nine weeks, leaving out the children that need uh, the daycare in the summer. And uh, they call up staff up last minute, cancel. We give them uh, 
the refund, open up the spot, and uh, go off the waiting list. But um, we like to start charging the $20 uh, cancellation fee uh, to prevent parents from uh, saving spots and you know canceling the last minute on staff because it is uh, consuming, uh, time consuming for uh, employees to get on the waiting list, call back, call uh, the parent back, and call uh, so on, going back and forth with uh, refunds and cancellations and so on. In regards to contract classes, the same thing, but it'll be a $15 cancellation fee uh, per child per session. And then for rentals, uh, we process 2,500 permits per year. And um, when a customer cancels a permit, it may impact revenue and the ability for other individuals and groups to reserve our facilities. So we like to charge a $25 cancellation fee um, if the cancellation is um, given and written to the facility supervisor two weeks prior to the event. And then uh, less than two weeks uh, prior to the event, we would like to take the one half of the rental payment. Uh, there is a lot of work that goes on with uh, facility reservations, uh, working with the patient, working with the client and facility setup, staffing, uh, meeting with uh, vendors and catering services and so on. So um, we would like to uh, charge these fees for cancellation. The only time that we wouldn't keep or charge the cancellation fee is if in the event there's a facility failure, uh, we would refund their entire uh, money for the permit and try to find another location for them uh, to have their party. Uh, the next fee is a day camp t-shirt fee. Uh, we have one camp, Verdugo Park, that goes on uh, weekly field trips. We uh, require each camper to wear a day camp t-shirt that will identify them um, at the field trip. The proposed fee is $5 uh, per t-shirt. The next fee is the adult soccer league um, at the sports complex only. So uh, the league has been in existence since 1999, ever since the sports complex has been built. Uh, in 2012, we increased the fees to $811. Uh, the last two years, we've um, extended the seasons with playoffs, championships. Uh, we've included trophies, plaques, and T-shirts, thus the cost rising. Um, due to the rise in um, costs, we'd like to propose an increase to $845 per team uh, per season. And all of our revenues will be deposited in the recreation fund to offset uh, operational costs, staffing and operational costs. Um, if we can, this is a compilation of a number of different things. Yes. Why don't we talk about it, maybe w each one? Sure. Because it, it, it seems like we're, we're over here, and then we're over there, and then we're coming back. So, so the first one is, is for the photography permits? Yes. Okay. Do we have any of the commissioners have comments or questions about the photography and the photo? The permits and well, again, this is only for professional photographers. Professional photography uh, for, like I mentioned earlier, weddings, baptisms, quinceañeras, bar mitzvahs, bat, uh, bat mitzvahs, uh, bridal showers. If there's a professional commercial photographer in the park taking pictures, then we would charge them the eighty dollars for two hours. How is this enforced? I imagine a lot of people just go up there and do it. Um, they do, but we have staff on site. Uh, luckily, we'll have our park maintenance staff or recreation staff on site. And if there's a, uh, a party taking a picture, we would require a permit from them. And we'd give them the customer service office number, and they'd fill out a permit. So we have our caretakers on site also at six locations. So any park, though, meaning? Any park. We want to so open it up to any park, yes. Okay. Yeah, you're just making it all inclusive. Yeah, all yeah. inclusive. Yeah, yes. that's how I read it. Yes. Any park. Would you have a sign there saying you need a permit to take yeah, a photograph? I, I believe uh, part of the city's uh, uh, master plan for signage will include the, that in the sign. The fact that sign can be in every picture. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so, so in terms of, so we're, we have our questions answered as it relates to that one. The, the next one... Um, in terms of, it looks like a cancellation fee for the camps and yes. classes and rentals. And what did you recommend that to be? Um, for the day camps, skate camps, um, $20, $20, contract classes 15 and the rentals 25 
Okay. And is that a certain percentage of the overall fee? Or is that just a... Um, just a random what other cities charge. I mean, we... Uh, I talked to staff from the city of LA and city of Burbank. They charge something similar okay. uh, between 15 and $25 uh, per child per, per session. Okay. Did anybody have any questions or comments about that? <clears throat> I'm concerned about cancellation. If the, it's a low-income uh, families that we are looking after them, uh, would that hurt them uh, to participate from beginning, telling them there is a cancellation fee, they're not going to be able to participate? Is that something we have to think about? Or they have their own emergencies? They're, Ill or there. I mean, if it's an emergency, or if it's, for example, if they bring a doctor's note saying they can, uh, the child cannot participate due to a broken arm, then you know, case by case basis. But this is more towards the parents that you know pay their uh, write a fifteen hundred dollar check for nine weeks. Okay, I have my son or daughter saved, spot saved for nine weeks, and then you know, two weeks into the program, they take a trip to Hawaii, and then we have a waiting list from. Um, um, other groups that need child care. Did you just say that? Did you just say fifteen hundred dollars? I'm giving you an, As example. an example. Yeah, I mean, example. So I mean, 20, for, twenty and these numbers are pretty small in relation. They're to very. What yeah. It's been forked out. You know. Yeah, it's a very small fee. I mean, this is mainly towards cool days camp since we do fill up at Pacific. Um, weekly rate is seventy five dollars between nine and four Monday through Friday. So a nine week session, you're looking at seven hundred dollars. Yeah. And what if child. they, you know, I, I guess mid, mid if they quit or terminate mid, mid, mid program, is that how does that work? Same thing. Uh, depending on circumstance, if the kid gets, if the child gets real, really ill, then we'll go out and we won't charge them the twenty dollars. We can give them the refund. But if they're absent, suppose they, if it's, you say like one of the programs is nine weeks, for instance. Nine. Well, they're they're nine one week sessions, okay. so they pay each week. Okay. So the child can be signed up for nine weeks, but if they uh, come to the first three weeks and then decide to take week four off, then we'll go ahead and give them the refund minus the $20. This fourth week. Okay. On the fourth week, yes. This cancellation applies to a, a reservation for a day camp slot. Um, so if they aren't sure but they, they make a reservation anyway and then they, the last minute they decide not to um, participate, then those that were on the waiting list, by then um, others that that would have participated have found other means, which were probably their second or third choices, and and so they get they get um, inconvenienced because because someone took their slot and then canceled. Yeah. So it's hopefully this will be a deterrent from from families doing that. Yeah, that's kind of sad when people or kids. Go ahead. Um, what's the percentage of uh, the people that staying outside waiting, not being able to get into the program? We Usually have. we get 20, um, 20 to 25 people on the waiting list per week, but what we do is we tell them to go to Maple Park or any of our other uh, facilities that have park, uh, day camps. Uh, but since, you know, Cool Days is an in, um, indoor camp, it's the more popular, it's on, <clears throat> it's on site at Pacific, we got more amenities such as the swimming pool and so on. So parents are more apt to signing their children up at uh, what Pacific. What makes us limit the... Uh number of uh, students to take in facilities we don't have enough facilities facilities at Pacific because we have to have a balanced <clears throat> programming with drop-in programming or senior programming or exercise class because we limit at 120 kids now per week we started off with 75 and we've bumped it up to 120 the last three years okay. um, the next one was the t-shirt fee you said it was five dollars yeah, five dollars um, we require the parents to purchase the t-shirts so we can um, identify their children while uh, on a field trip. Okay, and then the last one was the soccer, soccer league. Adult soccer league at the sports complex. Okay. Um, it was $811. We like to raise it to $845 per team. We've extended the season for an additional three to four weeks, depending on playoffs and championships, which require more staff time, plus uh, trophies and T-shirts and so on. Sure. Any questions, please? When you say adult soccer team, what do you mean by that? What ages? Uh, 18 and over. 18, over. 18 and over, yes. They have to be adults. Yes. And, and, and so we charge the team, and then, and then the team charges its own players to join right. the team. Sure. So, yeah. 
So usually we have 10 to 15 players per team. So it's basically $80 a season or $75 a season for them per person. Okay. Okay, well, thank you for that. Thank Is you. there any questions or do we want to make a motion? Well, I'll move to approve. Second. Okay. Commissioners Flood? Yes. Athayan? Yes. Yes. Wu? Yes. President Khan? Yes. Thank you. What's next? Thank you. 7B reports information only at one adult recreation center and senior recreational programs annual report. Good afternoon, President Khan, commissioners, and staff. My name is Julianne Leviant, and I'm, I'm the Community Services Supervisor at the Adult Recreation Center. So um, at the Adult Recreation Center, we are open Monday through Thursday, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. We are a community center that caters to the senior population, mostly during the daytime, even though they stay as late as 8 o'clock at night. So we are open to all ages for billiards, for um, backgammon, we have a lot going on. On uh, Friday, we're open eight to five, Saturday, eight to four, and then Sunday, we're open for lunch only. However, our hours do change when the heat advisory comes out that it's unhealthy for seniors. We do open for cooling stations later on Saturday, and then we do open on Sunday, as directed by, uh, by, by Oneg or, or Jess. Sorry, a little nervous. So um, at the Adult Recreation Center, we, we are coming on our fourth anniversary of our grand opening. And we are very busy during the day. Uh, just for an example, our dining hall, our, our biggest room, from 8 to 10 in the morning, we have exercise classes. At 10, we immediately change over for our lunch program, where we have 100 seniors come in for a hot lunch. Right after they're finished, we turn it over either for ballroom dance lessons, ping pong, pickleball, and that stays in play until 7.30 at night. It's just that room and all the other rooms are about the same. The billiards is, is packed from, again, from when we open till when we close and our exercise room also. So um, last year, or this is for the fiscal year 2012-2013, and we generated um, in rental revenue 40,748 and uh, for activity cards, gym memberships, uh, 22,853. And there's a lot more I can go over as far as anything. Is there any questions about any activities we offer, anything? I know you have some challenges and yes. you handle very well. You do a, do a beautiful job. Thank you. Yeah, I, hear, take them on. I hear very well uh, good things about uh, the place. Uh, people, how do you advertise for it? Well, it's, it's a lot of word of mouth. And, and with rentals, we're, we're increasing with rentals constantly. Once one person has a rental, I get phone calls that Monday. Hey, we were there on Saturday, and we want to know about it. So a lot of times when people come, to uh, a rental of a friend or a family member, they find out about us. So they, it's, it's a lot of word of mouth. Do they pay for their meals? Uh, for the senior meals? Yeah. It's a $2.50 suggest suggested donation for the meals. And it's delicious. And it's, what age is the uh, It's 60 and over. 60 and over. Yeah. Is it lunch and dinner or is it no, just? No, just a hot lunch. Just the lunch. And oh. financially, how do we do financially? With the meals? No, with the overall the adult, uh, adult center. I'm looking at you, but I mean, uh, with the rentals, with, I mean, uh, we have one of the highest for the um, activity cards. We have $22,000 in activity cards. That's just the $10 for seniors and the 25 for adults. And uh, that's relatively high from what I, I compared to the other sites. Do we come out uh, positive or how is it, how um, it works? Members of the commission, President Cobb, members of the possibly. commission, um, activity card wise, yes, for our drop in programming, we do make up. Um, ARC is uh, funded by the general fund, so uh, our revenues are deposited in the recreation fund. But since it's a community center, um, it's funded by the general fund and we're open to the public for recreational programs. Um, 
it's not an enterprise operation like the Civic Auditorium or the sports complex where we need to bring in the revenue to uh, maintain, uh, offset our costs and so on. We have so, volunteers helping you? Oh, we have a lot of volunteers, yeah. <laughs> we have volunteers that work almost over 40 hours a week with the senior meals, working the uh, pool, the billiard room, uh, front desk, uh, volunteer cadre there is very, very successful. And the commission does recognize them. Yes. 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 We recognized them last yeah, we month. Yeah, last month. Yes. yes. Are there areas there that you see that you'd like to see enhanced or improved? Not, not offhand. Um, I, like I said, there are a lot of the rooms are being used constantly, and we try um, staff to patch up the walls as we do. And I, I don't see any enhancement really needed. The central park looks amazing, um, so that doesn't really need anything. So offhand, I would say no. Great. And yep. anything that we've needed, we've done um, in house just with what we have. Great. One thing that staff really works on is balanced programming. Uh, we have our car players, backgammon players, we have our uh, bingo players, our GCC classes. So what Julianne and Steph try to do is to balance the program to fit everyone in uh, to the facility. So uh, she does a great job, and I know the participants there. I'm there actually. My office is there, and the participants, you know, they're there 7:30, 7:15 in the morning, even though it opens up at 8 o'clock, waiting to get in and you know playing pool, uh, cards, exercise, and so on. So uh, they're there uh, every day, six days a week. And uh, I remember when the facility would close at 4, uh, they'd leave. But now the facility closes at 8, and they stay till 7.30, 7.45. So it's, it's, it's a really busy facility. That's a, a great facility. Traffic. That's a nice facility. Uh, OK. I have one quick question. Please. Do you guys have any data as to the makeup of the senior citizens that are utilizing the Rec Center? OK, here's, here's my theory. and I'm, when you walk in, you see a lot of Armenian men, and that's not it. When you go everywhere else, you get every sort of, of makeup um, in the exercise room, in the lunch program, um, in the photography class. So it's, it's a little, it's, um, you kind of get a different sense when you walk in, but it's just kind of what everybody's doing. Um, there's, it's, it's, a, it's definitely a mix of cultures. But it could be deceiving when you first walk in. So you don't have any data as to do? And no data. We don't. We don't collect data on the participants. Yeah, we don't. Okay. So I mean, just visually, that's you know, and and I and I joke that my women have purpose. Women want to go to exercise. They want to go to lunch. They want to do bingo. They want to do photography. They want to do karaoke and then they're gone. So they're always, you know, mixing around. So when women come in and say, where are all the women? I tell them, you know, they're taking these classes. So um, it's, it's, it's a mix, but we don't keep track of, okay. of what it is. And men are purposeless? <laughs> That's they like to chit chat, believe that, it or not. <laughs> no, billiards, exercise true. room, backgammon, cards, um, socializing, a lot of socializing. So all those classes are held in English? So not, not any other language besides no. everything's in English. Mm -hmm. and, and all economic levels? Yes. When you say photography class, is that the teach? Then what do they do? They we, have a, we have a photography class. We work with Theater of Hearts, and they have a grant. We have a free photography class for seniors 55 and over. It's a 13-week session every Friday, 1230 to 230, and cameras are provided. It's do, a fine art photography class. Do we do anything with co uh, local corporations, uh, work for them, and do for, they need to uh, do some artwork for them? Uh, not, not yet. We're already in our, we're in our third session, so maybe when they're, and, and a lot of the seniors are taking the class because they're progressing, and so they're starting to do things. I think uh, this session they'll start with computers, doing it on the computer. Maybe something like that could definitely advance. Have we given any consideration to holding any of these classes in other languages besides English? Like which classes would you? 
For example, like the computer class, photography. I mean, well, we, we've done it. classes through Glendale Community College, and and again, those are are mostly in English. So we don't really have any classes that we teach. Um, we just do programming like karaoke, and which we do have a um, one of the Clark Magnet High uh, students made us a CD and words for uh, Armenian songs, and he that was his pro his senior project. So he was able to, to give that to us so we could implement that into our karaoke program. But we really don't teach any classes there. All of that's done through Glendale Community College. Uh, Commissioner we more or less have programming of, of exercise classes. and. Okay, those programs, are they're only offered in English, right? Have we given any consideration to offering those in any other language? Well, if I may just interject, the Central Library right across the ARC offers the classes that you might be thinking of in terms of English development or computer skills in multiple languages. So between the ARC services and what the library provides, there tends to be a balance rather than overlap. So if some of the seniors are interested or even the youngsters are interested, they can go to the Central Library across the way for those classes, which are many of them are free of charge or very nominal fees. They're in multiple languages. If, please, uh, President Khan, members of the commission, if I may interject, um, if 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 we determined or, or assessed that there was a a need that we weren't meeting of the users at the Adult Recreation Center, then we I'm sure we would consider in our, our programming uh, hiring staff that they could speak in, in, in those languages. Um, but that's that's what we'd have to do. We'd have to make sure that we have the staff resources to, to provide those classes. But you know, over time, if 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 things um, change and there's um, a, a demand for uh, bilingual or tri trilingual classes, we should definitely be open to that and um, accommodate that need as as it arises. Thank you. I think you raise a good point. So, thank you very much. Thanks thank for your presentation. You. What is next? Item seven B two Senior Services Program Annual Report. Now, now Maggie will be able to tell us what percentage of the seniors are able to pay for their meals and which percentage are not. Good afternoon, President Kahn, Commissioners and staff. I'm Maggie Kavarian, Community Services Supervisor with the Senior Services Programs. I have a, a very short PowerPoint for you um, explaining our Senior Services Program. We see that the senior population is growing in Glendale. It's a trend that's nationwide, but it's definitely a trend here in the city of Glendale. Our senior services program consists of senior case management, home delivered meals, and congregate meals. Our case management portion of the, uh, the program itself is funded through the 101 general fund, where the home delivered meals and congregate meals program is funded through our 270 nutritional meals fund, along with CDBG funding. Our senior case management program sees over 120 clients per year. We have two case managers that deal with multiple issues in the home. Here's an example of one. There was a hoarding issue and staff was taking out, um, actually it was a bug infestation, so they were taking out that couch. We collaborate with many organizations and we refer to and coordinate with a lot of interagency and um, kind of, we do a lot of in-house within the city and other agencies and we've got a list of those there. Here's another example of a success story where we went into the home, did the home assessment, and assisted the family. It was two seniors. We also had our Get Creative campaign this year. During Thanksgiving, we had a food drive that our city employees participated in. We had 120 bags created and um, distributed to needy seniors in the Glendale community. Here are some examples of those. Our home delivered meals program is successful. We serve 60 unduplicated seniors every year. These are our most frail elderly seniors that live in our community. Here are the requirements of the program. 60 years of age or older must be homebound and living in Glendale Locker Center or Montrose. 
and we've included a sample meal for you to see what a menu item would look like. Here are a couple of our participants along with our meal driver. Is there an income uh, com qualification or? You just have to be 60 years or older, elderly and frail, and we have to have a doctor's note saying that the participant is definitely um, frail and homebound. And, and they're not charged? And they are not charged. It's just a suggested donation of $2.50 per meal. This is an L.A. County funded program, and that is the criteria. Would they need to be living by themselves to qualify, or could they be living with a family member and not still qualify? Not necessarily. They can be living by, most of the time they do live alone. Um, but they do have caregivers that come in, but not enough for them to prepare meals for them. So sometimes there's a family member, but the family member is that we're in that sandwich generation where they have to go to work, they have young children, they have the elderly parent. So it is a very good program just because of that reason. So there are pa family members in the home some of the time, but very rarely. Can I ask you one question just to further interrupt your presentation? Is it, when you say 60, is it we could be doing more, but there's not the funding for that? Or is 60 about right where we're supposed to be at? 60 is really the age that the county set forth. But truthfully, there is that little donut hole of the adult with, you know, with multiple squirrels, squirrels per se. And we try to assist them with other agencies coming in and helping them, like Meals on Wheels. There's Salvation Army Meals on Wheels as well, but that is a charge, and that's a $6.50 charge per meal. So unfortunately, we are not able to help them, but there are other agencies that can. Okay, when I say 60, I don't mean the year. You, you said that 60. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, yes. 60 right. is usually the, the, that's the average. Okay. So we usually get 60 unduplicated every year. Okay. Thanks. How do we get them? We get them through phone calls from the hospitals, um, discharge planners, landlords, um, tenants that live in a building that they're in, uh, family members from out of state. It, go, it runs the gamut. You don't get them. They, they come to us. They yeah. actually come yeah. to us. We rarely advertise. We also had our Santa to a Senior program. Uh, it was a collaboration with Home Instead Senior Care where they provided gifts for our um, needy seniors, and here's a picture of that. Super of Glendale also collaborated with us this year, and they helped us with the Share the Love campaign to end senior hunger, and they provided us with 50 blankets this Christmas season. And here's a picture of that. And this year was our first year that we participated in the March for Meals program. It's a Meals on Wheels Association of America um, annual program that they've had for 12 years, but this was our first year, and we were very excited to participate. Um, our proclamation was actually accepted by Edgar Martirosian, if you recall the Oscars. He was the um, pizza boy from the Oscars. So he's an actual Glendale <laughs> resident, and he came and he accepted the proclamation on behalf of seniors. I think, uh, Commissioner Sharkey, you were in the audience that night. Um, yeah, it was very exciting. Uh, our own police chief, Police Chief uh, Robert Castro, also participated in our March for Meals campaign. He actually went out and um, did a drive along and delivered meals with our meal driver and got to meet a lot of our homebound seniors. And of course, our Congressman Adam Schiff, he also participated this year and he also did the same. He went and drove along and met some of our seniors and delivered meals. Our Congregate Meals program is very important. It's we serve over 40,000 meals every year to seniors who come into our site, like the Adult Recreation Center, Far Heights Community Center, and Pacific Park Community Center. I'm going to just backtrack to the Adult Recreation Center. Adult Recreation Center serves meals seven days a week. We're the only agency in all of LA County that serves meals to senior, every, seniors every single day of the week, and we're really proud of that. Far Heights serves meals Monday through Friday. Pacific Park serves meals Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Here's a menu item we wanted to show you. Really good meals. We cook them ourselves? We have a on-site caterer we contract with, Morrison Management Specialists, and they cook the meals on-site at the Adult Recreation Center, and then we deliver the meals to Pacific Park and to Spar Heights Community Center during those days. Pay them 250 for each person? We don't. We, we have a contract with them, and I 
not really sure exactly how much it is this year, but it's in the three to four dollar range. Would, would you like Would you like to volunteer to start cooking? Just <laughs> curious. <laughs> <laughs> so, how do we make up for the difference? Well, the county funds most of the program, uh -huh. and then we also have funding from as from a service level increase through our one hundred and one general fund. If If I might expand on that. Um, with regard to the senior case management program and the nutritional meals program, this program is very effectively leveraged between a city general funds, a federal community development block grant funds through donations. We'll collect between ten and fifteen thousand dollars in donations from those that are able to pay uh, towards meals um, and LA County funds. So we use four different funding sources, and unlike the programming programs at the Adult Recreation Center, there is a demand for Spanish-speaking caseworkers and Armenian-speaking caseworkers, so we do have, we did use the Federal Community Development Block Grant Funds to hire an hourly Spanish-speaking case manager because we have a significant Spanish-speaking senior population that needs case management, and we also have um, a staff members that, that um, speak Armenian to assist the Ar Armenian uh, seniors in the case management program. So there, there is definitely a market for uh, trilingual case management. Um, if, if there was a need uh, with the Korean population, then we'd be doing the same thing for uh, uh, Korean families as well. Uh, they have to be eligible for a certain uh, economically, or they can come in if they're uh, 16 and over, have the, the uh, lunch and leave. Uh, that's how it is? It, it, they do not have to be economically disadvantaged to be on part of this program. They just have to be 60 years or older of age and a Glendale resident. In, in, uh, with most funding sources, uh, it is presumed that if you are a, a senior, you are, are low income. Um, so that, that in and of itself always meets the, the income eligibility for most programs. One thing I will say, though, at, at the Spar Heights, they are upper economic but it's social it's so nice socially these people live alone and they maybe they have a big house but it's it's a nice social place get together and when they were doing the program evaluation for these programs the administration on aging had noticed two things the first thing that they had noticed was of course seniors are on a fixed income and they most of them tend to be low income but the next thing that they noticed was they were socially isolated and this was a really good way to get them out yes they were eating a meal but it gets them out it gets them to meet people and then it also gets them to participate in a lot of our recreation activities so it was a win-win situation it was nutrition along with socialization and that's why they created this program okay. great well thank you thank you for that presentation what's next 7B3 monthly activity reports at A is Human Services. Oh, good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, Commissioner Khan. Um, I'm sorry, President Khan and members of the Commission. Um, Moises Carrillo, um, we did submit a report to the uh, Commission regarding the Winter Shelter Report. And it's a report submittal, and I'm just really here to answer any questions regarding the report. This is, again, the Winter Shelter for the homeless that operated from December to March 2014. We uh, had 414 unduplicated homeless persons uh, attend the Winter Shelter this year. What was that compared to last year? Was that in... Um, President Khan, I believe it's around the same numbers. It was pretty much the same. Uh, I think what last year we did uh, use the armory, right. the larger facility, but the number of beds um, were the same as last year. So it's really the bed count. This year we had 70 beds that um, we kind of kept the numbers the same. Because yeah. I, I thought maybe the shifting of the location would impact it somewhat, but I guess it didn't. When the program ends, as has ended March 1st of this year, what are these homeless or senior citizens end up going to? Well, the homeless participants uh, are tied to Ascensia, and during the time that winter shelter, they 
um, get case management services and referrals. Um, some may be referred back to shelters in Los Angeles for a year long or a longer stay. Some may get into some of our programs. I think we have some stats that some of our participants did go into some of our local shelters, but they all get referrals uh, once the shelter closes. Of course, some do, do choose to remain homeless in the streets of Glendale or in LA or surrounding areas, but generally we do try to make referrals as much as possible to um, other agencies or other places where they can go to. The reason why I asked that is because you said to President Khan that this number was very similar to the number from last year. And if it's something that year in, year out, we're getting anywhere from th three to 400 homeless people, then yes, we are doing what we can to assist them and try to get them situated into uh, permanent housing. But for whatever reason, I guess the numbers never seem to diminish as we're what we're hoping for. I mean, so um, how do we go ahead and continue the program knowing that this year in, year out, it is very cyclical because numbers hasn't been diminishing, has it? Well, the number of homeless persons um, continue overall in Glendale continue to remain steady around the 300, 340 mark. Uh, winter shelter is a lot different because we do get homeless from other um, communities. Um, the loss on this is a, uh, a regional homeless winter shelter, so we do get a lot from LA. So LA's numbers are always fluctuating. Um, we do get from Burbank and Glenda and Pasadena. Uh, but to answer your questions, we, we again have that steady number. It doesn't necessarily mean that, our, that they stay here in Glendale. They actually do go back to LA and other areas. So our, our Glendale population continues to remain the same. Um, this again, it's the different circumstances, economics, uh, employment, and so on. So they do stay the same. Uh, our concern if it was drastically increased, but it has not uh, increased significantly. Well, maybe, maybe what you're asking is, are these repeat people from prior years? Or if there's someone from a prior, do they get referred out so they shouldn't uh, come back here? Or is this part of a, a year, integral part of a, a program? That's a good question. There is a number of um, repeat, I'm call them repeat customers that do come back from the general homeless population around the region to, I can't give you the exact percentage, but there is a number of repeat. We've seen clients from previous years whether they're in the streets and, and, and um, prefer to remain in the streets. Again, this is all of general, generally a weather kind of activated, although we're not weather activated shelter for those who are, um, and of course this was a very dry winter, uh, to get out of the elements. But there is a number, and I can't say it's 10 or 20 percent, that are generally um, repeat uh, clients. I'm sorry, what does that mean when, it's, when it says unduplicated? I thought it meant that they're new in the system. That's how I perceived it. So what does that mean? Yes, yeah, so the number between duplicated and unduplicated is two different um, types. Unduplicated means that person is counted once. So that person came to the shelter one. It may have stayed um, 90 days in the shelter. Um, a duplicated count with that person will be counted um, per night. And, and so that's a duplicated number. They're counted more than once different nights. So one person could have come um, you know, 90 days, and so we could have actually served 2,700 people um, this year. But given the numbers that we go with reporting, it's always the unduplicated count. Okay. So whether they stayed one day or 90 days, it didn't matter. You count them once. Yes, and generally in all of our human service programs, we count unduplicated numbers versus mm -hmm. the duplicated numbers. If we count duplicated numbers, we see in our, all of our programs thousands of people. What kind of programs do we offer or exist to help them to go to normal life? What we offer is several steps in homeless services, and it's a whole process called the continuum of care, and it's something maybe we should present to the, the commission. It's a system that gradually moves homeless persons from the streets into transitional housing, or now we're moving into permanent housing with support services. So there are six agencies or six programs generally that are assisting the homeless. And there are Sensia, which we know is the main homeless service agency in Glendale that offers the emergency shelter and the case management and, and basic counseling. And then there are the other agencies such as Door Hope, um, Path Ventures, that offer the transitional housing for homeless persons to get into. 
and then when they're more employable and they've got employment skills, their income increasing, then they're moved into permanent supportive housing. And that, again, Ascensia or Path Ventures, uh, even our city Glendale program has uh, supportive housing funds to assist homeless persons with housing as well as social services. So there is a gradual process of this. It's a very complex uh, system that's been developed over the years by HUD and implemented by the city of Glendale as part of a national system of moving homeless persons with our local services um, to permanent housing. Again, Salvation Army is one of our partners. Um, Essential again, Catholic Charities, a number of agencies participate in the system to move homeless persons to permanent housing. Again, given the economics of the city situation, uh, we can't always tell what, what's gonna happen with persons um, getting into homeless. Our Glendale homeless population, again, continues to fluctuate around the 340 uh, mark, but it has not gone up significantly, or of course down significantly. So something we're able to manage here in the city of Glendale, and again, our staff is always working with the agencies to uh, refer homeless persons to the right services. It does take time for them to um, graduate from their emergency shelter status into uh, permanent housing. Moises, was there anything from this that kind of surprised you or shed some new light on? I know the numbers were about the same, but any of the makeup, such as, you know, was there more veterans or less veterans? Was there more disabled or less disabled, or is it about the same? I think the numbers are the same. Uh, what we had um, before, I believe we did have some more seniors last year than this year, but again, I think a lot of it had to do with our, with our senior case management program who would work with, throughout the year, with a lot of our senior clients. So we did see a smaller senior population, but I think that's attributed to the senior services staff and case management, case management throughout the year. Uh, I believe the veterans um, did um, increase slightly. Um, we did have um, the Veterans Affairs Office and a number of agencies come in and speak to the veterans and offer them those kind of services where they're not here in Glendale, but they're in Los Angeles. So there was a small uptake in the veterans population. Okay. I'm sorry. Please. Um, while they're in the program, do you guys offer any medical or mental assessment to see what their immediate needs are? in addition to the housing? Yes, part of the comprehensive case management services does um, involve a, um, I guess we call it mental health um, screening. Most of them, well, most homeless person do have some mental health issues. So part of Ascensia's um, case management is having a therapist on site who works with the, um, the clients and do a mental health review. Uh, one of our agencies, Dee Dee Hirsch, Mental Health Services does a very effective job in getting referrals from um, the agencies to refer those homeless persons that need mental health assistance and they may be even medications that is required. So they do have a very comprehensive medical mental health service that uh, available for them if they choose to use that. And we've had some success with clients getting back on track because of mental health and getting appropriate medical services from our local agencies here in Glendale, again, that's D.D. Hirsch, and of course our uh, Ascensia with their mental health counseling. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for your report. Thank you. What is next? 7B3B, Park Planning and Development. President, call members of the commission. Uh, I, I'm not sure if you've had a chance to drive by Maple Park and Maryland Park, but they, those parks are uh, progressing in their construction. And we hope to have them uh, be open to the public sometime in uh, mid to late June, right when, um, right in the middle of summer when the kids are out of school. We're currently busy uh, processing uh, um, design contracts uh, to begin work um, replacing the lights at um, Fremont Tennis Courts as well as Dunsmore uh, Park. And we are also hoping to get started on the civic auditorium exterior improvements in terms of lights, um, pardon me, in terms of uh, uh, paint and uh, upgrading the lighting as well as some lands um, awning needs. Um, the rest, I'm hoping that by the time we come back to you in, uh, in July, we'll have several other projects underway once we get our funding, new funding for some new projects such as Fremont Park. That's my portion of the report, unless you have questions for me. 
Questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Item 7B3C, Recreation and Community Services. Okay, uh, President Khan, members of the commission, in your packets you'll find April's um, Recreation and Community Services uh, staff report. Um, in April, we had two events, um, citywide events, one being the sp uh, Spring Extravaganza, which was held at Pacific Community Center on April 12th. Um, we had around 250 uh, kids that participated in our Easter egg hunt. Uh, we had our Glendale Rocks, Park and Play Truck, uh, the library uh, had an arts and crafts table. So it was a pretty fun event for all the uh, kids in the South Glendale area. Um, we had another event on April 12th, celebrating the 10th anniversary of the Verdugo Skate Park. Um, this was a highly attended event. We had about 150 kids, uh, adults, teens, youth, skateboarding. Um, I was there and I saw a four-year-old uh, kid with his helmet and gloves and uh, pads and skating uh, in that bowl and coming up and I, I was in awe. <laughs> and um, a lot of kids um, uh, enjoyed the event and enjoyed the skate park. So uh, we were really happy to uh, see that. Um, as for Civic Auditorium, we had 21 events uh, in April, four event deliveries, total revenue $30,466. Our year-to-date revenue at the Civic is a little over 346000 Customer service and community center uh, revenue permit report. We had 224 revenue permits in April, 80 non-revenue, totaling $58,463. Our year-to-date revenue is $497,917, which represents a 13% increase from last year. So uh, staff is doing an excellent job marketing their facilities and bringing a new clientele to use our uh, fields and uh, facilities and so on. Any questions? Okay. Um, let me. I want to talk about cruise night a little. Um, I, we have uh, a few more weeks. Well, not a, about another month, uh, two months. Cruise night will be held this year, July 19th, on Brand Boulevard. Um, if anyone is interested in registering their vehicle, uh, they can go to glendalecruisenight.com, sign their vehicle up. Um, this year we're going to have uh, fireworks for the first time ever. We're having fireworks on the back of uh, the stage uh, at the end of the event around 1030, between 1025 and 1030. So if anyone was in, interested, uh, you know, we'll see you there. The event is held uh, on brand uh, between Milford and Broadway. Uh, they can sign up on uh, going on the website, glendalecruisenight.com, send in your form, and we'll see you there. Okay, thank you very much. Questions? Sure. Item 7B3D, Park Services. Good afternoon, President Khan, members of the commission. Uh, for the month of, see, what was last month? Month of March, we completed 151 work orders for demand work of which 103 were on gardeners and 48 work orders completed by our irrigation crew uh, for a total hours of approximately 605 labor hours. As in every month, we want to highlight a couple of the projects that we have pictures of that staff have completed. First is over at the Brandt Cemetery. As you know, the Brandt Cemetery as part of their agreement falls as far as the maintenance uh, falls under our jurisdiction. And it really, there's, there's not much over there. We don't have landscaping. We do not have uh, irrigation. It's mostly from the rain, the weeds grow, and we have to maintain it for, for one, aesthetics and also safety. So these are uh, pictures of the existing conditions uh, earlier uh, this last month. It is a beautiful site, by the way. If you have never been, one day I'd be happy to take you up there. Very unique in the way it is designed. And, and it is very difficult to maintain because of the terrain. And as you notice, there's a lot of rocks and the tombstones and headstones. And, uh, you know, the only way for us to maintain it is by having one guy out there and you, the weed eater, just knock everything down and, and clean up as best as they can. And while doing this, we also attempt to make sure the, the headstones are you know, visible so it doesn't grow over and eventually you end up not locating or identifying uh, one of the, uh, the burial sites. And uh, this is, again, a final product of uh, the top area. 
also at Brand Park, there were a number of projects. This one worth highlighting. This is right at the tip of the entrance where the planter is. It used to be a, a fountain. Now it has been a planter. We noticed a lot of the planting uh, not in very good conditions. <clears throat> so the goal is always to replace these areas with drought-tolerant planting. So as staff went through it, this is the upper layer. There is a lower layer. Uh, just removed all of the uh, plants from vegetation for this area, all the... Uh, weeds, prepared it for planting, and start identifying and locating drought-tolerant plants as we've done other sites. Um, this is a goal of us to continue doing a lot of our locations, so we'll be water-wise and beautify the place by, you know, whatever more natural plants belong in the area. At City Hall, we've had a number of small projects, and it's ongoing, and with landscaping, it's like cutting hair, it's going to grow back, so... Especially with weeds, abatement, it continues to be a challenge. Yet, uh, I know I feel you in some cases, the hair does not grow back. My, my, my. <laughs> so this one is a little more difficult. That's why I wanted to highlight it. The police garage, the, actually the garage, the Perkins garage right across the way has some vegetation that grows along the outside perimeter. And for us to maintain, we have to have you know, a couple of guys assigned for safety for the ladder to climb up there and try and keep that vegetation to a level that we can maintain and not completely seep down and, uh, and mostly for aesthetics and for, for the actual health of the plant. So it's one of our staff going up there with all the safety gear with two guys holding the ladder so he doesn't fall and taking care of it to actually give it what it should look like from the exterior. Casa Adobe de San Rafael, we did some work over there this past month. Uh, there's some trimming of the shrubs and uh, some tree work we also completed. This is the avocado tree, I believe, that needed some trimming and maintaining to, to raise it up. This is the garden area where one of our former members uh, of Glendale Beautiful, Doyle Kutch, had donated funds for us to plant. This is the Doyle's gar Doyle Garden, as we call it. This is the south southern part of the uh, lower part of Casa Adobe. Well, weeds were growing in there, so we had two tasks we did at this project. Staff had to go in and clean out all the weeds and do s minor planting to add a little more life to it. But the bigger project, as you notice here, staff, what they did is they identified what, how the borders should be and brought in some timber and some rods and actually created a border uh, on site so that now it is enclosed and we have the turf area separated from the landscaping. Actually gave it a nice little look, and this was a surprise to me when I visited the site because I thought the direction was the landscape, and there goes our clever staff. Uh, it does look nice, and we will attempt to keep this up in memory of Doyle Kutch, who uh, you may have heard passed away uh, earlier last month. And jumping on to Fremont Park, this is one of the projects that you have seen in the past, but Fremont Park is a large playground, and we... Uh, on an annual basis, we replenish the playground five bar. It is a large, big task with heavy equipment, number of staff to bring it in and uh, dump in the areas and have staff drag it, load it on, on the, uh, with, the, uh, uh, with the loader all around, spread it, and then uh, make sure all the fall zones have appropriate uh, five bar so, for, so that kids do not get injured as they fall. This is a challenge at every park facility, and uh, staff tries to keep up with it. I believe the last project we'd like to highlight today will be the Griffith Manor Park. Along the exterior of Flower Street, uh, it is a planter bed, yet uh, it does tend to grow uh, with weeds and overgrown vegetation. So this project was to clear out a lot of the vegetation, uh, smaller size, reduce the size of the shrubs, and uh, remove, obviously, all the debris, and ultimately bring in some uh, mulch, and uh, spread the mulch all around the area to give it a much better, nice, cleaner look. This is just outside, I believe, the, the uh, basketball court. That is all that I have for this evening. Any questions? Thank you. What is next? Next is item eight, adjournment. Any comments? Anybody? Okay, then we are adjourned. Thank you. Thanks.